皆さんこんにちは本フォーラムを主催しております国公私立大学図書館協力委員会の委員長官および日本図書館協会大学図書館部会の部会長官を務めております早稲田大学図書館長の飯島でございます主催,主催者を代表して一言ご挨拶申し上げますこのフォーラムの過去のテーマを少し振り返ってみますと3年前の2010年が欧米日の電子ジャーナルコンソーシアムの10年と今後というテーマで電子ジャーナルの話題2011年が大量デ,デジタル化の先にあるものというテーマで資料の電子化に関する話題そして昨年が質的転換を図る大学教育と図書館ラーニングコモンズの先にあるものでラーニングコモンズに関する話題といったようにそれぞれ注目を集めている個別のトピックを扱ったものでした今回のテーマは「The University Library of the Future」「大学図書館の未来」という非常に大きなテーマです皆様ご存知のように今日の電子情報環境の下では印刷媒体を軸とした伝統的な図書館機能はその役割を相対的に縮小しつつありますそして電子情報環境下で図書館がどのような機能を果たすべきかについては多くの議論があり大学図書館の未来は不可縮実であると言わざるを得ませんもちろん大学図書館が今後どのような方向に向かっていくべきかについては大学図書館関係者の一人一人が最適解を見つけ出していかなければならない問題であります本日はアメリカからイエール大学図書館の館長のスーザン・ギモンさんそしてユタ大学図書館副館長のリック・アンダーソンさん日本からは慶応義塾大学の田村先生筑波大学の五村先生をお迎えしております皆様とご一緒にこの大きな話題を考えていきたいと思います本日のフォーラムがそれぞれの大学図書館の皆様に有益であることを記念しつつご挨拶に返させていただきますどうもありがとうございます再び竹内でございますあの本日は本当に多くの方にご参加いただきまして誠にありがとうございますあの本シンポジウムの開催の趣旨につきまして、えー、企画の担当者といたしまして簡単にあのご説明をさせていただきたいと思いますで先ほど飯島先生からもご挨拶ございましたけれどもこの本シンポジウムは大学図書館にとって非常に掘ったな話題をこれまで取り上げてまいりました昨年はまさに話題が沸騰しておりますラーニングコモンズでございましたしそれから一昨年は書籍の大量デジタル化に大学図書館がどのように対応していくのかということを論じるものでございましたで私は、えっと、昨年も一昨年もそのシンポジウムにお招きをいただきましてコーディネーターあるいはその登壇者発言者として、まあ、あの関わらせていただいたわけでございますけれどもその際に非常に強く感じましたことはこのような個々の問題について検討し、まあ、理解を深めるということは極めて重要であるということを認識しつつもこれからの大学図書館の問題についてこれからの大学図書館がそもそもどういう役割を果たすべきなのかという根源的な問題について議論し理解をし,てしなければ我々は道を誤るのではないか、まあ、道を誤るというのはやや大げさな言い方ではありますけれども十分理解できないのではないかということをまあ感じたわけです例えばラーニングコモンズにつきましては今こちらこちらの大学でその大きな話題になっております
で、新聞や雑誌にも最近よく取り上げられておりますし、私ども千葉大学附属図書館にも多くの方がその見学にいらっしゃいますしかしながらこのラーニングコモンズというのが単にその文部科学省の政策的な文書の中で取り上げられたからあるいはこれをやればその政府の補助金がもらえるからあるいはそのその他もろもろのなんか、えっと、理由でですねえー、とこの着手,に着手しているのでは、これは単に流行で終わってしまうのではないかということを危惧するわけです、つまり予算や補助金が切れたときには、あちこちに、まあ言葉は悪いですけれども、廃墟の山が出来上がるというようなことになってしまうのではないかということを大変危惧しておりました。幸いなことににラーニンンコモンズに関しましまてははこれはもはや大学図書館の問題とということではなくて大学全体の教育改革の中に位置づけられるようになってきており、同志社大学をはじめとするいくつかの大学では、大学図書館の外にラーニングコモンズが作られるという状況も生まれてまいりました。まあ、このようなその図書館外のラーニングコモンズに関する是非というのはあると思いますけれども、しかしながら、全学的な課題となったということで、ラーニングコモンズの考え方がもはや後退するということはないだろうと。いうふうに思うわけですで、これはその大学図書館の活動を発端としながらも全学的な活動へと展開をしていった数少ない例外的な事例なのではないかというふうに思いますさてこのスライドですけれどもえっと私が大学図書館の未来を考える上で大変気にしております今年の6月にハーバード大学の図書館が提示した図書館のミッションステートメントですここには次のように述べられておりますハーバード大学は知識の創出、応用、保存、普及に自らを関与させることで学術と教育を進展させるこのステートメントの中には我々が慣れして親しんでいる蔵書構築、コレクションディベロップメントとかレファレンスサービスとかディスカバリーといったような、えー、図書館機能を示す言葉は全く含まれておりません。このステートメントは、大学図書館が図書館という建物やコレ,クションによとコレクションという伝統的な機能の殻に守られて、内向きの組織であるということは、もはや許されなくなってきているということを示していると考えています。2003年以降の日本の大学における基幹リポジトリの進展は、たとえそれが本当に順調に進展してきたかどうかということについては議論があるとしても、大学図書館の機能を外向きに変える契機であったのは事実であると思います。しかしながら、それはあくまでも契機であって、その後、われわれの行動というのが続いているかどうかということについては、大きな疑問があるかと思います。この次に我々がしなければならないことは何でしょうか。記録された知識を蓄積し、検索ツールを提供し、そしてアクセスを保証する、そうすることによって、新しい知識の創出に貢献をするという機能は、これまで図書館が担ってきた機能です。そしてこのことは、どんなに環境が変わろうとも、誰かが引き続き担わなければならない機能。とということができます大学図書館は、学術情報流通の一拠点として、引き続きそのような機能の担い手であり続けるのか、もし担い手であり続けたいのであれば、大学図書館は自らどのような準備をしていけばいいのかという課題が浮かび上がってきます。ラーニングコモンズだけで明るい未来が約束されているとはとても思えません。大学図書館が教育に関わるということを一方的に宣言したところで、もちろんそのように宣言することは大事であって、まずそうすることが必要であるとは感じておりますけれども、しかし、変化する教育,教育におけるニーズ、あるいは高等教育環境にどのように対応していくのかということを、我々は考えなければならないと思います
これまで述べてきたことは、大学図書館全体にとっての課題と言えるかもしれません。しかし同時に、大学図書館の未来を考える上で大事なことは、各大学の置かれている状況は極めて多様であり、大学図書館の未来はすべての大学図書館にとって同じではないのではないかということです。例えば、大規模な研究大学の図書館と、小さな短科大学の図書館では、大学の性格が違うように、大学図書館の性格も違います。大規模な研究大学の図書館に当てはまることが、小規模な短科大学の図書館に必ずしも当てはまるわけではありません。おそらくここにいらっしゃる皆さんの一人一人が、自分が関わる大学図書館の未来はどのようなものになるのかということを自ら考えなければならないのではないかと思います。本日、大学図書館の未来という、まあ、野心的というか、あの私らしい応募式というか、なんというかあれですけれども、非常に困難な課題を考える場に、スーザン・ギボンズさん、リック・アンダソンさんという、米国の大学図書館会を代表するお二人の若いオピニオンリーダーをお招き,したことお招きできたことを大変喜ばしく思っております。私は国立大学の付属図書館長としては最年少の一人のはずですけれども、今日お招きしているお二人は、私よりもさらにお若いお二人です。ギボンズさんにはあらかじめ大学図書館の未来に関して、教育を支援するという観点にやや重きを置いてお話をしてほしいというお願いをしました。また、アンダソンさんには、研究を支援するという観点にやや重点を置いて話をしてほしいというお願いをしてあります。また、イェール大学の図書館とユタ大学の図書館はタイプが異なっており、それぞれのご経験を踏まえた多角的なお話が伺えるものと期待しております。お二人にお話しいただいた上で、筑波大学の津村先生にコーディネーターをお願いして、パネルディスカッションを行います。パネルディスカッションの冒頭では、慶應義塾大学の田村メディアセンター長に、日本の視点から見た大学図書館の未来についてのプレゼンテーションをしていただき、その上でディスカッションを進めたいと思います。大学図書館の未来に向けて、われわれは今、何をしていかなければならないのか。そしてその中で何を優先的に行わなければならないのかということについて皆さんと共に議論し考えることができれば幸いです。皆様方の議論への積極的な参加をお願いしたいと思います。それでは最初にスーザン・ギボンズさんにお話をいただきます。ギボンズさんの経歴の詳細については、冊子にあるとおりですが、2011年からイエール大学の図書館長を務めていらっしゃいます。前任地のロチェスター大学でなされた図書館利用者を対象とした人類学的手法による研究の成果である、スタディング・スチューデンツをお読みになった方もいらっしゃるかもしれません。今回はギボンズさんの2度目の来日で、前回は2009年に東京工業大学を会場に開催された機関リポジトリの国際会議の折にお招きしており、その折にはギボンズさんの前任校であるロチェスター大学の機関リポジトリの取り組みについてお話をいただいています。それではギボンズさんよろしくお願いします。Good afternoon, and let me thank the、uh, forum committee members for, for inviting me here. It's, it's truly an honor to be here.、Um, I was asked to talk about the future of university libraries, and I'm coming at it from、um, the perspective of the United States, but I hope it is one that will translate well um, into um, Japan. So I want to start with、um, a framework. For how I think about the future of libraries. And it starts with the concept that libraries are now in a very competitive marketplace. This is a new phenomenon for us. 
This was not the case um, as early as 10 years ago. And as a result, because libraries were so long in a marketplace where we had no competitors whatsoever, we did not give a lot of consideration to how we could make our services and our collections easy for our students to use because we knew they had no place else to go. Now we have um, lots of competition. We can look at Google or uh, in the US Amazon and other places like that that often provide information that might not be the same quality as the information that an academic library can provide. But often, they can provide that information in a more convenient way, in a more intuitive way. And that presents a real competition for us. And so I think it is necessary for libraries to be aware of that um, competitive marketplace that they're in and to respond to that. If we don't, then I fear that libraries may end up being victims of what Christian Clayton um, has called disruptive technology. That something comes into the marketplace that is um, easier and more intuitive to use. It may be inferior at first, but it very quickly develops and soon takes over the traditional provider of that service. So I think it's important for us to think about libraries in that framework and to not presume that libraries, just because we have a very glorious past, that does not mean we're going to have a very glorious future unless we are actively involved in shaping that future and considering how we can change to be better. The second consideration is to think about the universities. Um, considerations of the libraries. Um, in uh, the marketing world or in the world of business, it's called the return on investment, the ROI. So if a university is providing its library with thousands and millions of dollars or uh, yen, um, what does a university get back? There was a time when I think we could have easily answered that question, again because we were not in a competitive marketplace. Today, I think we have to be much more articulate and marketing the library internally to the university to explain why by having this library, this is how the library supports teaching, research, and learning at the university. And without it, this is how the university would suffer. Um, so it's important for us to not presume that university presidents and chancellors understand this still because many think in a digital environment, the, the, the library becomes less important. I would argue we become more important, but we need to be ready to articulate that and to be able to explain why a continued investment in the library is warranted, it's necessary, and it's needed for the betterment of the university, not just for the sake of the library. My third um, point is that I believe academic libraries require a constant realignment with its university. So as a university changes, so too must its library change, because the library is there in service to the university. And so if the university starts to develop new programs, new strategic initiatives, the library should be mirroring that. The library should be doing the same and to, for the library to instead hold on to the traditional areas of where it was strong and where it was, for example, collecting in a particular area, even though that area may not be taught on campus anymore, or in fact, the program has shrunk and there's a much larger program in a different field, the library needs to be able to move quickly to start supporting that. So as librarians, I think we have a responsibility for studying the strategic plans of our universities, to be asking questions of university administrators about where the library is, I mean, where the university is going in the future, and thinking about how the library can help to make that a successful future for the university. And again, if we don't do that, then I think we become vulnerable um, as being seen as not as, um, as being seen as infrastructure, but not strategic partner. And we should be a strategic partner. The fourth point is that as a result of this, I believe in the future academic libraries will become more different than similar. In other words, if each library closely aligns itself with its university, 
and we see each university diversifying and saying we have a, this is where our focus is and we're quite different than this university over here, I think the consequence of that is the libraries are starting to, going to become very different and that the successful library is the one that best matches the needs of its university and is not necessarily, you cannot look, sorry, I want to say, you cannot have a single model for an academic library. Success should be determined by how your university values the library. That should be the measure of success, not when you compare one library against another library and say that collection is bigger or we have more reference questions on that one. That's not an important measure. The measure is are you useful to your university and in what ways. So I think the future of academic libraries will be one where we will diversify. We will all go in different directions to support the very unique needs of our universities. So the question then becomes, how do we ensure this alignment? How do we make sure that our academic libraries are serving our universities? Some of the more traditional assessment methods that libraries have used include surveys and focus groups. You bring together a group of students and you ask questions. What's your experience in the library like? The problem with these two kinds of assessment methods is they presume knowledge. They presume that you know what questions to ask. You can't create a survey without first knowing what questions you want to ask and then often providing the answers, check the box. That presumes a lot of knowledge that I don't think we necessarily have. I think today's students are very, very different than when any of us were, in, were at university. Technology in particular has changed that experience. And I think we can get ourselves into trouble when we presume our experiences at university are similar to the ones today and say when I was in college, this is what I did at the library and assume that today's students are doing something similar. I think it's safer for us to say we have very little understanding of what it is like to be a student at our university of what it's like to be a professor at our university and therefore we have to ask questions in different ways that we cannot send out a survey and say are you satisfied with the library or send out a survey and say um, what new services do you want from the library because our students can't even imagine what services we could provide it's presuming too much so I'd like to um, spend the rest of the time um, explaining a methodology that I helped to develop that looks at this question very differently. So it is, um, this methodology was started at the University of Rochester, which is where I was for about 12 years. And in 2004, we invited an anthropologist to join our library staff. Her job, her name is Dr. Nancy Foster, her job was not to be the librarian for anthropology, but instead to be an anthropologist and to help us study our students and our faculty to understand how they use libraries. So what um, Dr. Foster was able to do was take methods of study from anthropology and ethnography, which are two fields that study people and how they interact in a society. We borrowed those methods, we adapted them, and started studying our students and our faculty. And the purpose of these studies, and we've done it for over 10 years, has been how can we improve library services, our digital presence, and our physical facilities based on a much deeper understanding of what it's like to be a student or what it's like to be a professor at our university. So the process starts with a question, and that's what the circle is doing. The question, and we'll go through a couple of the questions, the question might be, um, why do students who are in the sciences continue to come and use the library when most of their research material is online? So that would be our very broad question. The anthropologist would help us develop methods to study that question, and we would go out and we would gather the data. Then we would study the data and come up with high-level findings. 
And then the hardest part of all was then we as an organization had to change. And that is the toughest part of this process because you may find out information that is not comfortable for you. For example, we found out that we were closing our reference desk too early, that our students were studying, their peak study time was 11 o'clock at night to two in the morning. And we had already gone home. So the hard thing we had to change was we had to change the hours that we worked to make sure we were there when the students needed us. That's the kind of change that is sometimes necessary. And so you needed a commitment to this process that says, if we find some uncomfortable findings, we are committed to thinking about changing. And if you don't, then you can only go through this cycle once or twice before your students and your faculty no longer believe in the process and no longer believe that you have a true interest in changing. So you cannot ask them these questions too often without showing the results of what you have learned. So you need to go into it with a commitment for change. So I want to give you two examples of this kind of work. And the first one's going to focus on undergraduate students. And the question um, is focused on research papers. This undergraduate student um, research was a two-year project. So we spent two years understanding at a very high level what is it like to be an undergraduate student at the University of Rochester. And then my second example will focus on how you can design library spaces, library facilities, using user input. So if we go back to that wheel where, we had, where you start with the question, the question here was, what makes for an excellent research paper? And what do students do between the assignment of the paper, the professor says, write a research paper, let's say 15 pages, due in two months. What does the student do between the time they were assigned the paper and the day they handed the paper in? That to us as librarians was a black box. We could see the assignment was made, we could see the paper was turned in, but we didn't know entirely what happened in between. So our question was, what happens in that black box? The first thing we did was we interviewed professors. And we said, explain to us or describe an A paper, so a high mark paper. What does it look like? And we were very surprised to learn that it was different based on the professor. So for example, one professor would say, um, you cannot get a high mark on a paper unless you have used the citation style that is necessary in my field. Uh, MLA will be an example. Another professor would say, I don't care about the citation. You know, that doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is the quality of their writing. And another would say, the quality of the writing doesn't matter. What I want to see is sort of that there's a, that there's a grain of, an, of a really important thought in there. And even if they can't articulate it well, I want to see that the thought is there. So three different expectations to get the A paper. So for our students, it becomes very confusing because they do the same effort on each paper and they get different grades. So for us, we saw one opportunity for libraries is to be the translator. It is to make students aware that there are different expectations, different expectations between different professors, but also different expectations between different disciplines. A paper in history looks very different than a paper in physics, but a young person doesn't recognize that yet. It takes them a while to recognize that the different disciplines have different requirements. So as we looked at the black box to understand what was happening, we first um, gathered some volunteer students these were students who were writing a major research paper across one or two semesters. We shadowed the students throughout the semester. By that, I don't mean we followed them. <laughs> but instead, we communicated with them regularly. And we said, we asked them questions. Have you developed a topic for your paper? Do you find that you're finding the information you need? Um, are you worried about getting the paper finished at this point? 
those kinds of questions. And then the day that they finished their paper, we brought them in for an interview. And we asked them to relive the entire process that had been going on. And as they told us the story, we invited them to write pictures and draw out the process. So for one student, this was the process that he went through to write his paper. And we have an entire transcript, an entire interview that goes with this um, drawing. Here's a more complicated one. <laughs> this was a two-year process. And as we went through this and they relived the experience, we would ask some probing questions. We would ask, where were you when you were working on your paper? What time of day? Who did you talk to? What resources did you use? What equipment, what technology did you use? So it's a very rich interview because we kept asking these very probing questions. So we learned a lot from this process. And one I'll start to point out, you can't see it probably. It's on the bottom here. It says, sent introduction and conclusion to mom. <laughs> OK? And at first, we thought, oh, how nice that <laughs> he gets along with his mother. Um, how nice that they have this relationship. We continue with the interviews. On the red interview, we see that the student called mom and said, what do you think of the topic for my paper? In this interview on the bottom, different student, uh, the student emails the paper to his father. And the same day, his father responds with advice on how to improve the paper. Now, never did we ask, what role did your mother or father play in the writing of your paper? It never occurred to us that there was such a relationship going on. I think for many of us, when we were in college, we left home, we moved into college, we might call once a week, maybe. We might visit once a semester, maybe. This is very different today. Um, and it's not just a US phenomenon. What's part of the reason for this is the fact that um, technology, it's a free phone call. When I was in college, it was very expensive to make a phone call to home, so I did it once a week. And it was 10 minutes, no more. Today, it's free. Texting is free. Emailing is free. So technology is allowing that communication to continue without any costs. So that's part of it. So what we were seeing, whoop, let me go back. What we were seeing is, <laughs> we'll get to that, as the, um, is what we call in the US uh, the helicopter parent. Helicopters hover. And so we use the metaphor of a parent who is hovering over their children while they are in college. They hover in very interesting ways, including if they're not happy, if the child is not happy, they'll call the, the professor and say, why did my daughter get a bad grade on your paper? Those kinds of things are, are happening a lot. Um, so what did we do with this information? That's where I go to the screen. OK. So at the University of Rochester, we used to have freshman orientation. In other words, the first day the students came to campus, they would be in an auditorium like this. We would, and the librarians would come on stage, and we'd say, welcome. We have a great library. We have 250 databases. We have 7,000 books. We go on and on and on. The students did not care, and they shouldn't. It was their first day on campus. The questions in their mind were things like, what classes should I take? Will I get along with my roommate? Is this the right college for me? Should I have broken up with my girlfriend? Those are the questions that are very important on day one. What's not important is the library. So we stopped freshman orientation. Instead did parent orientation. And that's what it looks like. We would invite the parents who were on campus. They dropped off their students, and they're hanging around campus. They wouldn't go home. So what we did was instead invite them to breakfast with the librarians. And we talked to them about the library. We explained to them all of the resources the library had. And what we said was, at some point in the semester, 
your son or daughter will call and say, I'm working on a research paper. Tell them or ask them, have you talked to your librarian? And send them to us because every class has a librarian and we know these assignments better than anyone. So pass them to us. So the idea was we knew the students were not ready to hear about the library at the beginning. But it turned out the parents were very, very interested. So we delivered the message about what the library can do to the parents. And we asked the parents to deliver the message to their children at the point of need so that it, it was an important message and it was an effective message and it was a message that the students would actually respond to. So this parent orientation now has been going on for seven years and it's been very, very successful. Um, and the university was very appreciative that we were entertaining these parents because otherwise they're wandering about campus and getting in the way of the students moving into the dorms. So that was one thing we learned through that process was this relationship with parents that we were unaware of. Another thing that we learned was that the, the students were unfamiliar with the expertise of our librarians. We have two more pictures. In other words, they thought librarians were, quote, helpful people, which we are. But at the University of Rochester and at Yale University, the librarians also have advanced degrees, like a PhD or a master, in the field that they are the librarian for. So the political science librarian has a PhD in political science. The history librarian has a PhD in history. We discovered that our students didn't know that about us. They thought that we were generalists, that we could give low-level advice. They didn't realize that we had an expertise that they could use for their research papers. So at the University of Rochester, we used the idea of Pokemon cards, and we created a set of trading cards. <laughs> and this is the League of Librarians. It's, each of these are the librarians. On the back is information about how to contact the librarian. The funny thing that happened is it became a contest as to whether you could collect the full set of cards. <laughs> so we played with that. We made it a contest. We encouraged the students to go visit with each of the librarians and try to get each of the trading cards. But in the process of doing this fun game, you came to understand there is a history librarian, there is a manuscript librarian, there is a film studies librarian, and they came to know us through the game of collecting these cards. Faculty then would take the cards and they would hand them out to their students in class and say, if you have a question on the research paper, here's the person to go and talk to. So it was fun. We could hand out business cards, as we do all the time, but we didn't think the students would really pay attention to them. So we decided by using these trading cards, we would make a game out of it, and it would be something that they'd actually keep and refer to when needed. At Yale University, we do something different. Yale is the, not quite the kind of place where Pokemon cards would work. <laughs> um, so we have to be a little different at Yale. To understand Yale University, um, it is one of the largest academic libraries in the United States. We have 15 libraries, 13 million books, and a staff of over 500. Most students have never experienced a library like Yale's when they arrive, and they are terrified by it. Um, our libraries look like cathedrals, it is, and you can easily get lost in the stacks. So what we have done is we recognize that these students are intimidated by the library, and we don't want that to happen. So starting with your freshman year, before you ev even come to campus, you are assigned a personal librarian. So what this is is approximately 35 students to one librarian. So a lot of librarians participate in this program. So each librarian has 35 students. They welcome the students to campus with an email. They invite them to have coffee or to come to a reception. That's what those pictures are. They will write to them throughout the semester by email and say, are you working on a research paper? And if the student responds, yes, I am, they'll start a dialogue. What's the paper on? Did you know we have this database? Did you know we have this collection? 
why don't you come in, we'll have coffee, and I'll explain to you how to do your research. So what we're trying to do is personalize a very complicated library system for our incoming students. By their junior year, by the third year, they are then declaring their major. They are saying, I'm going to be a physics major or I'm going to be a history major. At that point, the personal librarian introduces you to the librarian who is the expert in that field. So that by the time you end, you graduate, you've had two librarians who are there, you know on a first name basis, and are there to help and support you throughout the program. So we did something very different at Yale that fit Yale's culture. Um, and these are just pictures of some of our librarians and their interaction with students. Often you'll see a senior thesis, because many of our students have to write a senior thesis. You'll see in the acknowledgments, thank you to my personal librarian, Bill Massa, or, or whomever. So now let's turn to designing spaces. Um, and to do this, the idea is that we would like our library spaces to be welcoming places, to be places where students wish to be and wish to study and find it convenient. Um, and we don't know what students really want. And so we wanted to be able to explore that question with the help of our students. So we use various methodologies to ask this question. One was to hand out a camera. And this was back in 2006 when you could still get disposable cameras. Today you would just use, ask them to use their cell phone. But wrapped around that camera is a list of things we wanted the student to take a picture of. They would take the pictures, they would come back, we would develop the film, now we would just look at the picture, and we would start to ask questions about the, what we saw. So the three pictures here are the answer to the question of your favorite place to study. And the two far pictures, um, that's their dormitories. That's where they sleep. In this picture here, this is a room in the Rochester Library. What we were able to do, though, if you look in that top picture, you can see lots of library books. So we were able to, by seeing those library books, start to have a conversation. Well, when do you check a book out of the library? When do you just use the book in the library? When would you choose to photocopy the chapter that you're interested in? How do you arrange your material on the laptop that we see there? What software? is on the laptop. What systems do you use? So each picture gives us a platform by which we can ask lots and lots of questions about the student's life. For example, one thing we noticed was that there were um, lots of laptops. But when we asked the question, not this one, we also asked the question, what do you always carry with you? And they would take a picture of their backpack and the material that was in it, we rarely saw the laptop. And this was about five years ago. And we really saw that while the students were purchasing laptops and bringing them to campus, they were not using the laptop outside of their dorm room. And it became a goal for us to create a laptop-friendly library so that the students would bring those laptops in so that we didn't have to keep paying for more and more computer stations. So we knew from the picture the laptop had got to campus. We were trying to figure out what does it take to get it out of the dorm and into the library. And the answer to that question was lots of outlets, lots of plugs, very strong wireless, wireless printing. And when needed, you could borrow a lock for your laptop so that you could go use the restroom and not worry that your laptop would be stolen while you were gone. So those were some of the key factors in addition to the weight of the laptops just getting lighter with better technology that got the um, laptops out of the dorms and into the library. But that for us was a goal. We wanted to be, create laptop friendly spaces. And the furniture has to be different for a laptop. The amount of space that you create at the table if you're going to invite a laptop in, means you need a laptop in the middle 
and then lots of other material around it. Another question was, take a picture of a place in the library where you feel lost. And this should clue you in onto some of the problem facilities that you have in your library. The top picture is a picture of the book stacks, and the book stacks at Rochester and the main library at Yale were built at the same time and look exactly the same. Very, very dark. Um, you can't tell where you are. There's no orientation. They were designed to be closed stacks. So now that people are in them, there's nothing that guides you to where the exits are in the elevators. It's very, very disorienting. So they felt lost in the stacks. What this picture is showing when we interviewed the student to understand it is next to the elevator is a little piece of paper. And the paper was the guide to where the books are in the stack tower. And what they were saying is, even when I look at this guide, I still don't know how to find my book. And that's very problematic. And it set us down a path of how to make the stacks more intuitive. We used different color paint to guide you, that different floors have different colors. And we used the paint to guide you back to the elevators, to guide you to the stairwells. So it, we didn't tear it down and rebuild it. We had to work with the structure we had. But you can do a lot with color and with good signage to try to deal with it. But we did not realize this was a problem until we asked the question, where do you feel lost? And, it's a f and now you can go back and ask that question. You won't see that these are the problems, but you'll see other parts of the library has become a problem. So it gives you an opportunity to ask a question, see where the problem is, try to address the problem, try to fix it, and then go back and ask the question again and see, are you seeing the same photographs or are you seeing new photographs? And that's your way of assessing whether you have been successful in those changes. Another thing we did to understand libraries as place, physical libraries, was to do design charrettes or design workshops. Often what it was was a sign that said, $5 free food this way. And the students would come because they like free food. And we would give them poster boards and markers. And we would say, draw for us your ideal library. So it's a, a blue sky activity. It isn't, how can we improve this library? It is, imagine the perfect library and draw it. So we would start to get these pictures. And when we were able to renovate space at the University of Rochester, we went to the architect not with an idea of what we wanted the space to be, but we went to the architect with the drawings of the students and said, the space we want to design should respond to what the students are showing in these diagrams. What we saw in these pictures was for undergraduate students, there's a real importance to the idea of the library as a neutral space. What I mean by that is we would do an exercise where we'd have a map of campus, and we would say, pick your favorite color, circle the buildings on campus that you like to be in. Take your least favorite color, circle the buildings of campus that you are not comfortable in. One of the patterns we saw was that if you are not an athlete, not a, a, a sports person, you did not think you were welcome in the, the gym. If you were a science student, you did not think you were welcome in the music building. If you were a humanities student, you assumed you were not welcome in the chemistry building. So by putting labels on the buildings, students, by reading that label, decide, am I welcome there or not? With the library, it was always circled as being a positive place. Because for them, everybody is welcome in the library. It belongs to everybody. And all disciplines, all majors, all students are welcome and can, can be represented by the library. 
And if you think about it, there are not many spaces left on campus that actually are still neutral spaces. So I think it's important for us to celebrate that about libraries and to make sure we always feel like that neutral space that everyone is welcome in. Something else we saw was that the students really wanted the library to be a symbolic and inspiring space. So they would say, when I'm ready to really work on my research paper or really study, I want to leave the dorm and I want to go someplace that is ins inspiring. I want to be in a physical surrounding that is serious and it makes me feel more serious about the work I'm about to do. So it's important that library spaces be places that have that awe-inspiring aspect to it. They need to be comfortable, and I'll talk about that, but they also need to be a place that symbolizes higher thinking and really inspires our students to do well. The other thing we saw was the importance of flexibility. We could see that technology is constantly changing, and those changes require our libraries to change as well. So many of us, I assume, put Ethernet cables all throughout our libraries so you could plug in your computers and your laptops. And now we're replacing those with wireless hubs all over the place. That something else will come next. I have no idea what it is, but something else will come. And we need to prepare our library buildings to be flexible. So now we want chairs that are not just chairs like you're sitting in, but chairs that have a tablet so your laptop can sit on that while you're typing. That kind of furniture was not needed five years ago. So we should be ready to constantly change the furniture and the environment to adapt to whatever technologies are needed today. And we don't normally do that. We often buy library furniture to last for 50 years, a big heavy oak table. Um, and we're surprised when the students say, I don't like this. Why can't we have modern furniture? We also saw in those drawings food and drink. And this was, I'm sure it's controversial. It was controversial for us. But they said, I stay in the library until I get thirsty. And then when I need a cup of coffee, I'm done. I pack up, I leave. And we decided we didn't want that to happen. So we changed our food and drink policy that was done at Rochester and I did the same at Yale. Not in special collections, there's still no food and drink allowed there, but in our areas where we have a circulating collection, we allow food and drink into the building because we know that the students will stay longer and if they stay longer, the chances of them interacting with us and interacting with our collections goes up. And our thinking around that is these are books that circulate anyway. And when they circulate, who knows what the students do with them? They take them to coffee shops. They take them home. They drink a cup of coffee. They might go to the beach. I don't know. But why should we protect the books when they're in the library when we then allow them to circulate and horrible things happen to them? So that was our analysis of why we should change our policy. Something else we learned from those designs of ideal library spaces was the idea of there's multiple learning styles that we were not aware of. I think libraries have traditionally been designed for the quiet, solitary student. You sit all by yourself and you read quietly and you do not interact. It's the sh in the library. However, what we were seeing from the designs was a desire for more collaborative learning spaces, for the learning commons, I think, that was the theme of your conference last year. The collaboration is coming out of the classroom because we can see assignments from faculty that say, form a team, and the team should work on this problem. The team should do a presentation. The team should do a project together. Where do those teams go if they can't go to the library and have to be quiet? So we wanted to make sure that we could design spaces in the library that also supported those teams as well and to be a collaborative learning space. 
So we know of at least two learning styles, quiet, solitary, collaborative group with some level of noise. And you need to design both of those spaces within your library. And I presume there are actually more learning styles that will start to emerge that the library should be looking for and then think, thinking about how can you design for those spaces. So at Yale University, these are four examples of Yale, our Divinity Library, this is our law library. Over here is the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library. And up top is the Sterling Memorial Library, which is our humanities library. These are examples of that awe-inspiring, quiet, solitary um, places to study. And it's important that we preserve these places. But it's also important to have spaces like this. And this, I think, again, goes back to the idea of the learning commons. At Rochester, this space was designed based on the students' input. And what we saw was that they wanted food and drink, and you can see there's drink and food around. They wanted flexibility, so we bought furniture with wheels. Tables had wheels on it. The chairs had wheels on it. We had whiteboards with wheels. And what we did was we said, this space is going to change every day, and that's fine. The furniture was never in the same place day after day. It moved everywhere. So we invited the students to take the pieces of furniture they needed for their group, to pull that furniture together, and to create their ideal space. And when they were done, anyone else could come and take those chairs and take the, the whiteboards and the tables and create their ideal space. So we could not guess, do we need a room for eight, or a room for six people, or a room for 12 people? We didn't want to guess that. Instead, we just created flexible environments that you can adjust as you need to. We've also done this at Yale. Um, and these pictures are of a new Center for Science and Social Science Information. And again, you see furniture with wheels. The furniture moves. We created, this is an outdoor space that you can go outside. The importance of having natural light became very clear in a lot of our drawings. Um, and we have spaces up in the top corner of where you can do poster sessions. You can have presentations. You can have speakers coming in. We want the library to be that intellectual commons of the university, where people come and gather and discuss and have lectures and share ideas, poster presentations. We always want the library to be seen as the obvious place for an activity like that to happen, even if it's being sponsored by a department other than the library. And the bottom picture is the Bass Library, which is our undergraduate library at Yale. Um, we wanted it to be more flexible with w wheels and such, but again, the Yale way wouldn't allow us to go that far. So it's not quite as flexible as our newer library is. What we found out by doing these design workshops was that the ideal space for graduate students is different than the ideal space for undergraduate students. And we were not aware of that. We assumed graduate students felt as comfortable in our library as our undergraduates. So we started a two-year study of our graduate students and asked a lot of questions. Um, one of the questions, which I won't go into here, was what are the barriers to completing your dissertation? Why is it that so many students do not finish their PhDs? And what might the library do to help in that process? So that's an important question for the university and for the library to be studying it and to be trying to find solutions really demonstrates that the library is a partner with the university. Here we were interested in space. So when the graduate students describe their ideal space, the first thing they said is, we don't want undergraduate students to be in the space. 
And at first, we didn't like that. <laughs> we, we asked, well, why would you not want undergraduates? But they, it turns out they had a very good reason. And at least at the University of Rochester, the graduate students are also um, teaching assistants. They are laboratory assistants. They play all the, of these different roles. And what was happening is they would go to the library to work on their work, to work on their research, and the students in their class would see them and come running over and say, I'm so glad you're here. I'm stuck on this problem. Can you please talk to me? So the graduate students were looking for a place that they could go where they were just the graduate student trying to do their dissertation and not the teaching assistant, not the laboratory assistant, not all the other hats that they wore on campus. So once they explained that to us, we saw the logic of it and we felt it was a valid, a valid point. The other thing for graduate students is they need to work alone because in the end their dissertation has one author. So they have to work alone, but they would like to do it in the company of others. What we were seeing, especially for our humanities students, was that they were working in their apartments off campus, and they were feeling very isolated, and they also were thinking that they were failing because they were really working hard, and they were struggling, and they did not realize that the struggle of writing a dissertation is natural. It's part of the process. So what they wanted was a space where they could work by themselves, but see other graduate students suffering the way they were suffering. They wanted validation that what they were experiencing was natural. And they weren't going to see that in their apartment, but they were going to see that if they had a graduate student area. Then they asked for a variety of seating, meaning sometimes they're reading a book and they want to sit in a comfortable chair. Sometimes they're working with a laptop, they need a table with lots of space. Sometimes they wanted a carol that would block off seeing anybody else. So they wanted a real variety of spaces. And lastly, they want lots of power outlets so they can plug in their laptops and they wanted very good lighting. So we took those ideas and did some more design workshops. So in some cases, we would say to the students, here's the floor plan. Here's furniture, which is drawn to scale. Lay out how you would design this space. And that's what they would do. Or we invited them in and we showed them furniture. Here are four different chairs. Which chair do you like the best? In this case, the young woman is looking at different color schemes. Which color scheme do you like the best? What colors would you like in the room? What fabrics do you want? Because in the end, it's the students who are going to spend the time in the space, not the librarians. So what we would do is we would pick furniture we could afford, and furniture that wasn't really crazy, and then said, of these four pieces of furniture, which one do you like the best? So they weren't able to choose from anything. They weren't able to choose any color, only the colors we were comfortable with and felt was appropriate for our library. But once we had four palettes of colors, why not let the cho students choose? So whenever we could, we would go back to the students and say, make a decision, vote. Tell us what you would prefer. The result of that was a real sense of ownership. These students would say, I helped to design this space, and therefore treated the space very well, but also were quite proud of it and used it a lot. So it, it, there's no risk in giving students these choices, so long as you first bounded the choices by what you can live with, by what you can afford, by the colors that are OK, by fabrics that meet university standards. Once you've done that, let the students choose, I think, because it's their space, not our space. So the graduate student rooms that were designed, we ended up with two of them. And the interesting story here is that we went to um, an alumnus, a, a very generous alumnus, and we told the story of why we thought our graduate students needed a space in the library. 
and he was so impressed that he wrote the check to design this first space, this red space down here. He came in and saw the space. He saw all the students working there, and he wrote a second check and said, do it again. And we did a second space for the students. So the power of this is that you get stories. You have evidence to try to convince whether it's your funding agency, your university administrators, a nice donor. You have real evidence of how you think you're going to be able to make a meaningful change as a result of what you want to do. And it's the stories that sell it. It's not the statistics necessarily. Often it's the best story that gets you the money. What, it's hard to see about these spaces, but along in that top picture, what's along the wall are lockers. So what we didn't want to do is there's seating for about 35 students in each room. We did not want to give 35 graduate students a key to the room and say we're done. Instead, what we did is we put lockers in. And the lockers served together, the two rooms, about 150 graduate students. So the graduate students got the key to the locker, and the card swipe got them in the room. So that meant we could serve many, many more graduate students than if you just assign them a carol and say we're done, because they don't all come and study at the same time. So they share the room, but so far they've been able to share it in a way that is very effective. The fact that they have a key to the locker gives them a sense of ownership, and the lockers were designed to be big enough to put their laptop and many books in so that they didn't have to carry this material back and forth to campus from their apartment back to the library. And this ended up being a very effective and very, very popular solution for the students and it kept them away from the undergraduate students. So that was another type of library space we recognized we needed to build. So to summarize, it's important that you consider borrowing the methods of how we studied these students, but don't borrow the findings. In other words, every university is unique. Every student group Every faculty group is unique. So what happened at Rochester, I'm finding, is different than what happens at Yale. The students at Yale need something very different than the students at Rochester. It is because the curriculum is different. The residential halls are different. The environment is different. It snows a lot in Rochester. It doesn't snow as much in Connecticut. That changes. Whether your students are commuter students or live on campus, whether they're mostly science or social science, everything is unique and different. And therefore, take the methods for how to ask these questions, but don't assume that our findings match your campus. And there is now a group of librarians who are all over the world using these methods and developing them and sharing them. So Anthrolib, that big first word there, is the name of the group. They have an email listserv. There's a bibliography that shows the reports of all the different projects that are going on around the world. And it's a peer community. They're teaching one another. They'll say, I tried this. I tried a photograph um, exercise, and this is how it worked. I tried a diary exercise, and this is what happened. I worked with some architects, and we tried this exercise, and this is what happened. Um, so it's spreading around the world, and it's really helping each individual library think about their unique population and making some changes to result to that. Um, and it's a growing community of anthropologists as well as librarians that are developing this. You do not need an anthropologist on your staff to do this kind of study because you can borrow the methods and the protocols that were designed by the anthropologists and adapt them to your campus. But you may very well have graduate students or faculty on your campus who are anthropologists or sociologists and want to participate in a project like this. So at some universities, the anthropology department 
has partnered with the library to do these kinds of studies as well. So to conclude, I really feel that libraries must change or else we are in danger of becoming irrelevant. That they will be more efficient solutions to some of the services that we offer. And unless we start offering better services or new services, like for example data management um, is something that's very big in the United States. We are now hiring data management librarians because it's so important for faculty to have assistance in preserving the data that comes out of their research. I think that we don't have to guess what our library users need from us. All we have to do is find ways to ask the questions and to see the library through their eyes. We work under the theory that it's easier to change the library than it is to change the work practices of our faculty and our students. We can change more than we can ever change them. But for this to work in your library, you have to invite experimentation and you have to be accepting of failure. So what I did not show is there were um, projects that we tried that did not work and that was just fine. We created a culture in the library that said experiment, see if it works. If it does work, then let's have the hard discussion about how do we build this, how do we sustain this, how do we spread it and make it larger. If it failed, we didn't spend a lot of money on it, but be sure to tell the rest of us that it didn't work so we don't repeat that process. You have to create a culture that says it's okay to try something and discover it doesn't work. And if you don't do that, then this kind of work is not, gonna, is not going to grow. So the idea is to develop an R and D mentality, research and development mentality. We exist in a research environment. The university is a research and teaching environment. And we should encourage within the library and within the library staff that same mentality. We should be doing research. We should be understanding what the future of our library should be by asking questions, by doing research projects, and responding to what we learn. But again, it's a cultural change. It's a change of your organization. And it really needs to be at the top as well. So if the library director, the library dean, whatever title they have, does not embrace this, it's not going to work. Because they have to be ready and committed to making the changes that have to happen at the end of the research. And if they're not committed, then you'll have a finding that says, we should do something different, but no authority to make those changes. So it's very important that the organization embrace this as a whole and say, we're going to start doing these kinds of experiments, asking these kinds of questions, and everyone can participate. What we had at Rochester was nearly a third of the staff participated in one of these projects. They could be a cataloger, a reference librarian, someone who shelves the books in the stacks. We never, we, we always said, anybody who wants to participate, raise your hand. And that's how we built the teams. So the idea is if you have a group that's coming from across your library, then they are bought in. They buy into the findings and they are committed to the change. So you want to bring as many people into the process as possible. So with that, I'm finished. Um, arigato and thank you very much. どうもありがとうございましたあのご質問あるかと思いますがあの複雑な質問は後ほどディスカッションの中でやりたいと思いますのでもしも何か事実を簡単に確認したいといったようなご質問があれば今お受けしたいと思いますがいかがでしょうかはいどうぞあの会場が非常に狭いので申し訳ありませんがあのマイクのところまでお越しいただけるようにお願いします、えー、と関東学院大学の小山と申しますあの一つ、えー大学院生の,あの部屋についてお伺いしたいんですけれども、えー、とリザーブとかいうシステムは、えー、ございますでしょうか
Uh, no, we do not. Um, each room has about, seats about 30 or so, and we thought about whether we needed reservations or not, but we decided to first try it without. So try it the easy way, and then put policy or procedure in place. And we found that the students come at such varied times during the day that they were able to find spaces when they needed it, and we didn't need to put a reservation system in. What we often found with other rooms is people would make a reservation, and then they wouldn't show up. And then there's the question, well, can someone else use it or not? So it became first come, first gets the space. But with those two rooms, there really was seating for 70. And that seemed sufficient. Um, um, and we didn't need to go that way. ありがとうございましたあのちょうど時間となっておりますのでまだご質問あるかもしれませんが、まあ、後ほどのディスカッションの時にお願いしたいと思います、えー、疑問さんどうもありがとうございましたそれでは続きましてリック・アンダーソンさんにお願いをしたいと思いますリック・アンダーソンさんのご経歴については、冊子にある通りでございますけれども、現在、ユタ大学ウィラード・マリオット図書館の学術情報コレクション担当の副館長を務めていらっしゃいます。皆様の中にもご承知の方がいらっしゃるかと思いますけれども、あのスカラリー・キッチンという非常に有名なあのブログがございますけれども、そこに、えー、と定期的にお書きになっていらっしゃいまして。先ほどもあの有名なあのスティーブン・ハーナードさんにいろいろご意見をなさっていたかと思いますがあの学術情報の世界では非常に刺激的なあの情報発信をされているお一人です。今回はあの初めての来日ということでございまして、まあ、それどころかのアジアにいらっしゃるのは初めてということでございましてあの皆様方の印象があのアジアの印象を決めてしまうのではないかというふうに思っております。それでは安藤さんよろししくお願いいたします。Thank you. It, it's my great pleasure to be with you today.、Um, in, in light of, of Susan's、uh, comments, I, I, she was talking about helicopter parents who hover over their college students. And、uh, when I was in the airport on my way to Japan, I was actually reviewing my college student daughter's.、Uh, Essay that she had to write to be、uh, accepted to her education program.、Um, she sent it to me and said, Dad, would you look at this and let me know if it's okay?、And、it was exactly what Susan was talking about. So I, I don't think I hover too much, but maybe, maybe a little.、Um, so I want to talk in, in more general terms about the future of research libraries generally.、Um, and I, I What we, what we heard from、uh, Susan is fantastic, and I agree with everything that she said. And I want to emphasize that there is a real danger of, within the next 10 years, of the research library as we understand it becoming irrelevant.、Um, and I think another way of expressing that is to say that I am confident that 10 years from now, Nobody will be wondering, oh, I wonder if the library can give me access to the information that I need. They will either not be wondering that because we in libraries have become so good at giving them what they need that they never worry about it, or because they've stopped thinking about the library altogether.、Um, if, in fact, that happens, if, in fact, people are no longer Asking themselves, can I still get the information I need? This will be very good news for them, but it may not be good news for us.、Um, what I, now, because、um, Susan and I are around the same age, neither one of us can think about retiring for another 17 to 20 years, yeah, depending on what happens with the economy.、Um, and, and that means that we are very, very concerned about. The future of the library 10 years from now,、um, because we're still going to be hopefully working in one.、Um, and what I wish I had was a crystal ball 
and I, I checked with our translators to make sure that the, the term crystal ball means the same thing in Japan that it does in the US. But you know, when you have a crystal ball, you look into it and you can see exactly what's going to happen in the future. I don't have that. Mine doesn't work. Um, what I do think that we have, though, is something that's more like a kaleidoscope, um, where you can look in one end and there are lots and lots of little pieces that are, that are sort of transparent and colored. And as you turn it, the pieces fall into different patterns. You know what I'm talking about? And every time you move it, you get a different pattern. When we look into the future of education and of libraries, I think we can see a lot of the pieces, but it's very hard to tell what pattern they're going to fall into. Um, and and the, the particular piece, the particular example that causes me to lose sleep at night is the iPod. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later in the presentation. But the iPod, to me, is an example of a, a, an innovation, a technology that was intended to do something, but in fact had a much deeper and much more disruptive impact than anybody could have anticipated. Um, so in order to talk about the future, the, the first thing that we need to do is make sure that we understand the past. And so I want to talk a little bit about the past uh, and, and what has brought us to where we are in libraries right now. Um, for really almost 2,000 years, information was trapped in physical objects. And I, I think of that period, and, and in particular the print era, which only goes back less than 1,000 years, really. Um, I think of that period as, I call it the Gutenberg terror. Um, I know that terror is maybe sounds a little extreme. Um, but as somebody who wants to have access to information, imagine if it were 1980 again and you woke up with a question. Maybe you woke up in the morning and you said, I wonder how many dolphins migrate past San Francisco every year. In 1980, if you had that question, you had two choices. You could either go to a library if, if you were one of the very privileged elite in the world who had access to a library. Bear in mind that the vast majority of people in the world did not have access to a library. So if you were one of the lucky few, like me, and I'm sure like most of us in this room, you had the option of getting on your bicycle or getting on a bus or getting in your car maybe or walking to a library and asking a librarian to help you answer that question. That wasn't what happened most of the time. Most of the time, if you woke up with a question, you said, huh, I guess I won't get that question answered. And you went on with your day. Nobody does that now. My children say to me, whenever a question arises, if we're in the car or if we're watching a movie, and one of my children says, haven't we seen that actor in something else? In the past, you'd say, oh, yeah, I think I have. Huh. And that would be it. <laughs> now, what, what do your children say? They say, Look it up on your phone. Actually, they used to say, look it up on your phone, Dad. Now they just look it up on their phones, because now they, they've all got uh, phones. But anyway, so think about what it was like in 1980. Even when you, got to the, when you got to the library, you would have to flip through a card catalog. Ooh. Card catalogs were horrible. They were a horrible way to try to find access to information. Um, or, or you would ask a librarian for help. Um, but whenever I hear my colleagues in libraries talking about what we think of as the good old days of, of libraries, what they're talking about is what was the good old days of being a librarian. It was not the good old days of being somebody looking for information. It was the dark ages of looking for information. And, and I should be very clear that, and I know many of us in this room, myself included, have very fond memories of the old days of libraries. Some of my happiest, happiest memories of childhood were spent in libraries.
but it was not a good time to be looking for information. So that, this period, the terror, the Gutenberg terror, was broken by, obviously, by the internet. And actually, not even so much the internet itself. The internet came about in the late 1960s. What changed everything about looking for information was the advent of the World Wide Web, which put a graphical interface on the internet. And, and by putting a graphical interface there, it made it possible for millions and millions of people to put all kinds of documents up and make them easily findable on the internet. That changed everything. And it did it in stages. As far as, now, as, far as scholarly research is concerned, the first big change happened with journals, right? Because journal articles were a very natural, obvious thing to put on the internet. Everybody knew that it, immediately that reading an article online, or at least finding it and skimming it online, was something that many people would want to do. And articles just naturally migrated online. So that happened first. Next, what happened was books started to find their way online. And we all remember Net Library as, as the, the real pioneer of ebook uh, provision. And, uh, and eventually, other companies came along and, and did the same thing. They started, uh, ebooks started going online one by one. But now, in recent years, we've seen massive book digitization projects that are putting books on a wholesale basis up onto the internet. So the Google Book Project is, is the most obvious example. Um, the Hati Trust Initiative, which grew out of the Google Books Project, is another example. And we're going to see more and more of that as time goes on. But the interesting thing, I think, that has happened um, since, since all of this information migrated online is that we now have a whole different way of dealing with print. Print hasn't disappeared. But uh, as, as I put it here, it's been, the, the terror has been tamed and domesticated. Um, and, and to me, the, the, um, the most interesting example of how we're now using print is the, uh, the emergence of the espresso book machine. I know there are a couple of these machines in Japan right now. There aren't very many anywhere else. There are a couple in the United Kingdom, and there are 10 or 12 of them scattered across North America. Um, and can I see a show of hands? If anybody here has, is not familiar with the Espresso Book Machine and what it does, would you raise your, maybe I should say, who, who is familiar with the Espresso Book Machine? So it, it looks like about half of you. So I'll, I'll explain very quickly how it works for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, the Espresso Book Machine is basically two printers that are connected by a saw and a pot of glue. It's actually a very crude machine in a lot of ways. But it's also very, very cool and exciting. Because what it does is the machine hooks into a network um, and a huge database of printable ebooks. And so um, there's a computer hooked up to the, to the machine, and you can look up the books in the network on that computer. And then if you find a book that you want, you hit a button. And what happens is one printer prints out the text block, so the pages, the interior pages of the book. The other printer prints out a full color cover for the book. And then when the text block is printed, a little arm comes up and grabs it and brings it down, and a saw cuts off the edge, and then it puts the glue on the edge, and then it brings the cover over, clamps them together, trims the book, and spits the book out a slot. It's like a candy machine for smart people. <laughs> it's incredibly cool. But what's so cool about it is the fact that you don't have to have, you, you can turn an ebook into a printed book in the very moment that you need it. So you hit that button, and 10 minutes later, you have a printed book. This is huge. This is really, really exciting. Um, and, and, and what, but, but I want to emphasize, you know, print, print on demand has existed for some time. If you, 
If you work, there's a book dealer in the US called Ingram, uh, and I'm sure that there are book dealers in Japan who do the same thing. They have similar print-on-demand machines in their, in their warehouses. So if you order a book, and it can be printed that way. So for instance, from Oxford University Press. Oxford University Press makes its entire backlist available on print on demand. So they don't print a print run and keep it in a warehouse and hope that they will sell them all. They wait, and when you submit an order, they print it up and they send it to you. That's great. That's not nearly as good as being in the library and saying, I want this book, and the library saying, great, have a cup of coffee, come back in 10 minutes, we'll have the book here for you. That's very, very different. Oops. So for a very long time, during the, during the print era, the library really served as a temple. Um, it, and, and, and what happened was that the librarian was like the high priest. And those of us who used libraries would make a pilgrimage to the temple. And we would come as supplicants. We would come and say, please, Mr. Librarian, would you give me a book? And for many years, librarians, you, you couldn't get a book out of the library without asking for it. And the librarian would look at you and say, yes, I think you're worthy of this book. And would go and get the book and, and let you borrow it. Now, in the last 40 or 50 years, it's become much more common that you can just walk into a library and take the book down off the shelf. But for many years, you had to ask. Um, but all the way through the print era, you had to go to the library and, and basically ask for the book. What the internet has done, and, and Susan touched on this very, very articulately, what the internet has done is it has turned the library from a temple into a storefront. We are now one source among many sources for access to information. Um, and we are no longer even the only source for high quality information. There is, there is very, very good high quality information that is easy to find and that is free to use that you can find on the internet. Um, and, and I think what's very important for us in libraries to understand is that we are competing in a marketplace where the scarce resource is not information. The scarce resource is not even money in, in the marketplace where we compete. The scarce resource is time and attention. We are competing for our patrons' attention, and we're competing with a lot of other entities who are not trying to fix the patron. They are not trying. Google is, Google is beating libraries at the information search game because they don't try to turn people into better Google users. We have historically spent a lot of time trying to turn people into better library users. Google pays attention to what its users do and changes itself. We have tended to pay attention to what people do and try to change them. And we can't do that anymore because we now have competitors. Um, the internet has basically broken the monopoly that libraries have historically had um, by doing several things. One thing that the internet has done is that it has drastically lowered the, uh, the, the, the cost of a piece of information. There is still expensive information out there that libraries broker access to. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But there is an awful lot of high quality free information available now. And by making that free information available, um, the internet has, has undermined the library's role as a broker, as, as someone who buys the information on behalf of patrons and then makes it available to patrons. They don't rely on us to do that in the same way that they once did. It has also um, broken our monopoly by making it easier to find information. You can now do a keyword search in Google and in many, many cases, not always, but in many, many cases, very quickly and easily find what you need. Um, and that has undermined the library's traditional role as a guide and as a gatekeeper to information. Um, the internet has completely taken over from libraries the role of providing quick answers to simple questions. 
It used to be that people would come to the library all the time with relatively simple questions, questions that they didn't have access to the answers to, but, but that, that were not difficult. Nobody comes to the library, with, nobody in their right mind comes to the library with those kinds of questions anymore. It's too easy to find those answers elsewhere. Um, and that has undermined the librarian's role as an authority figure, uh, as an authority figure in information seeking. It has also undermined the library's role as a destination. When people don't have to come to the library anymore to get answers, they, they come less, except, uh, well, well, well it, that's actually more complicated, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, uh, one of the really interesting things that the internet has done to undermine the library's role is it's made it possible for us to search the complete text of a document without reading the entire document. For a very, very long time, the only way to find out what information was contained in a document was to read the whole thing or, or to use an index. Many books had indexes. Not all books did. Um, even those books that did have indexes, an index is a terrible way to find out what's in a book. It's very crude, it's incomplete, and it's very subjective because it's put together by a person. Um, being able to actually search the full text of the document without having to read the document from end to end is a very, very powerful capability. The internet is what made that possible. Um, and then, of course, the fact that the internet makes virtually ubiquitous access to information possible. Any place where you can have your computer and get a signal, you can have access to an awful lot of great information. That has really undermined the library's role as a physical destination. And then there's the open access movement, which is a very interesting development that is also made possible by the internet. There, there would have been no open access movement without the internet. Um, and we in libraries tend to be very supportive of open access, and, and in fact, we're, we tend to be pushing it very strongly, um, despite the fact that to the degree that more and more high quality information becomes available for free, um, people will rely on the library less and less for access to it. And that's fine. What matters is that they have the access. It doesn't matter that they rely on us for the access. But that does have implications for our future as libraries. So here are some, um, some things that are true right now. That, that we have to face as libraries that are going to have implications for us going forward. One of them is that the library collection constitutes a, a very, I'm just gonna say a bad guess at what our patrons actually need in order to do their work. Um, in the past, it was our job to try to guess ahead of time what our patrons were going to want so that those materials would be on the shelf when the patron came to the library. We didn't want the patron to have to come to the library and say, oh, you don't have what I need, would you try to get it for me? We would do that when we had to, but we wanted people to get what they wanted as soon as they came and not have to go away and, and come back later. And so as a result, we would try to guess what people wanted and that's what the library collection is. It's an attempt to guess what people are going to want. We've never done a very good job of guessing what people were going to want, but for hundreds and hundreds of years, we had no other choice. That was how we had to do business. One of the problems that we have now is that not only are people able to find good information outside of our collections, but also our budgets are getting cut either they are getting, they're, they're either getting cut literally so that our collections are, are, our budgets are smaller every year, or they're getting cut in practice because they're not keeping up with inflation. I don't know of a single library that is, and I'm sure there are some, but I'm not aware of a single library that is getting budget increases every year sufficient to meet inflation. Uh, I, I don't know if that's true in Japan. It's certainly not true for most of us in the United States. Another thing that we have to deal with is the fact that our reference services, our, you know, our service desks in the library, are 
increasingly being bypassed. Um, we, in many libraries, we are not seeing more and more people coming to our desks and asking for real help. Now, some of them are coming to the desk and asking for directions. We certainly get a lot of that. But people coming to the desk and asking for research help, um, that does not seem to be a growing phenomenon in many research libraries. And actually, that's a very good thing because the other problem with reference desk services is that they actually do not work. They do not scale to the numbers of people that we are trying to serve. The only reason we believe that our reference desk services are working is that the vast majority of the people they are supposed to be serving do not ever try to get that service. If they did, the entire service would fall apart. It doesn't scale. This is a serious problem. And then the third problem is that uh, what I'm calling here the OPAC, the library catalog, the, um, the, the library's online catalog, has been completely eclipsed, completely pushed aside as a discovery tool by our patrons. Um, and actually, that's as it should be. Um, because when you talk about a discovery tool, you're talking about something that answers the question, is there such a thing as a book about X? Or is there such a thing as an article about X? The library catalog can't answer that question. It can answer the question, does the library own a book on X or an article on X? It can't answer the question, is there such a thing like that out in the wider world? What people use to answer that question is Google. Google can't do it perfectly either, but it does it a lot better than library catalogs. Even library catalogs with discovery layers and federated search capability, they are still radically incomplete. The other problem with library catalogs is that they are user hostile. Um, we try to be user friendly in libraries, but our catalogs basically tell our patrons that they're stupid. <laughs> if, if you go to Google, and let's say you're, you're doing some music research and you're looking for something about Mozart. If you go to Google and you enter the word M-O-Z-R-A-T, Mozrat, Google will say, oh, you said Mozrat, but you're probably looking for Mozart. Is that right? And if, if not, if you're really looking for Mozrat, that's fine. Click here and we'll look for Mozrat. But we think you meant Mozart. Here are the results for Mozart. If you go to a library catalog, in most cases, and enter Mosrat, the library catalog says, you are stupid. <laughs> of course we don't have anything with Mosrat in it. Go learn how to spell. When you've learned how to spell the word Mozart, then you can come back and try your search again. That's what library catalogs have traditionally said to our patrons. Um, and, in, and as a result, and not only as a result of this, but, but, but I think that this contributes um, about, now this, this study is getting kind of old now, and I, I'm not sure when OCLC is going to repeat it again. Um, but a few years ago, OCLC did a study and asked people, where do you start when you are doing research? And this shows you that the vast majority of people start anywhere other than at the library. Um, in fact, in, in this survey, only 1% of the people who responded said, I start my research in the library. Now, one problem with this particular result is that this is a survey of the general population, people generally. And so you might look at this and say, well, sure, that, this is true of people generally, but Surely, if we interviewed college students in particular, they would say, more, more of them would say, we start our research in the library. And of course, that's true. In fact, if you look at this, which shows you uh, college student responses, you'll see that that number doubles. Twice as many students, 2%, <laughs> start their research in the library. So. The fourth aspect of the current reality that, that we need to deal with is the fact that um, circulation, the, the checking out of books in our libraries, has gone down very dramatically in recent years. 
Now, this is, this is what the circulation trend looks like at the University of Utah. You can see that between 1997 and 2012, a 15-year period, um, the, number of, uh, the number of books checked out per student has gone down by over 60%. And this is not an unusual number. I calculated this rate for every one of the ARL libraries, the large research libraries in North America. There's about 125 of them. I calculated this rate in the same period for every one of those libraries, and this, this curve is very typical. It's not true of every library. In a few libraries, circulation has actually gone up. But in the great majority of them, um, the trend is exactly like this. Uh, and I don't know whether this trend is typical in Japan. It would be interesting, it would be interesting to know. Um, so we've talked about the past. We've talked about the current reality that we're dealing with. Now let's talk about some interesting things that are developing that, that I think tell us something about our future. Um, the traditional library served two very different functions at the same time. First of all, the library provided access to documents that people needed in order to do their scholarly work on a day-to-day -day basis. That was one very important function. Another important function that the library served was that it acted as an archive of our intellectual heritage. Um, and the, the library, the research library, um, and I'm sure this is true in Japan as it is in the US, that really most research libraries are two very different libraries in the same building. One of them is the library, uh, what we call the general collections, the collections that people, that students and faculty use every day that they can check out and take home with them. And then there are the special collections, which are, tend to be rare and unique materials are, and are kept um, locked up and can be used under only very restrictive circumstances. Um, both of those functions are very important. They are completely different. They are two different libraries. What I'm talking about here is mostly the general collections rather than the special collections. Our general collections served as an archive almost accidentally. Um, if, you know, if there are 125 large research libraries, I couldn't know for certain that a commercially published book is held by that library in particular, but I could know for certain that that book was going to be held in one of those libraries and would be to some degree available going forward into the future. Um, what's happened though as, as uh, what, what I call commodity information, the, the books and articles that are bought and sold in, in the regular marketplace. As that information has moved out of the print environment into the online environment, it has made it a lot easier for us in libraries to serve the day-to-day -day information needs of our patrons. But at the same time, it has forced us to compete with other providers of that kind of information, as we just said. Um, but it also makes the archiving function of the library a lot more difficult because so much more information is being produced and distributed every day than we can possibly archive and manage. That's a real problem for us going forward. Um, archiving, a, archiving a printed book entails certain challenges, but archiving an e-book is, is much, much more difficult. And in fact, defining what an archive would be is very difficult. So, as we move out of a print realm and into an online environment, what we're finding is that we can do a lot more of providing information just in time rather than just in case. Providing it in the moment that the need is felt by the patron um, rather than providing it ahead of time. The online uh, migration also has led to a breaking down of the walls that divide the library collection from the rest of the information world. They, we've been able to make those walls uh, porous so that information can go in and out more easily. 
as we have moved, um, as, as the price of, uh, of scholarly information, and especially scholarly information that's published in journals, continues to climb, and that price is climbing at a pretty steady rate of seven to 10% a year for journals in the, in the sciences. Um, but as our budgets stay flat, what we're finding is that we are decreasingly able to buy books and, and other content based on our speculation about what people are going to want. Um, and we're also spending less of our money and less of our time buying things just to make sure that somebody has them so that they're safeguarded and, and held for future generations. These two things point out a very important dynamic in the economics of scholarly information. And really, this is true of economics generally. And that is that as, as the financial situation gets more difficult, libraries are forced to become more efficient. We are forced to worry more about waste. In the past, we would say, well, we'll buy this book. We don't know for certain that anybody wants it, but it's a good book. It's the kind of book that our library ought to have, so we'll buy it just in case. In many, many cases, that turned out to be a wasteful purchase because many of the books that we bought were never used. Now, you can argue about how wasteful that really is, but in terms of the day-to-day -day needs of our faculty and students, that represents waste. The less money we have, the more we have to worry about that kind of waste. That's a very powerful dynamic that's uh, impinging on us right now. Um, the less our books, our physical books, circulate, the more we find ourselves shifting our budget away from printed books and towards ebooks and, and journals. Because we know, certainly in the case of journals, those tend to be more heavily used at a, at a science-oriented research library. Um, and so as the budget gets tighter, it's gonna move away from the low-use materials and it's going to move towards um, the high-use materials. And then all of these things together the shift to online information, the fact that we can get better data about how and whether our collections are being used, the fact that budgets continue, to, or uh, I'm sorry, the fact that prices continue to climb, and the fact that budgets continue to shrink, all of those, I believe, are going to lead in, within the next 10 years to the end of what we call the big deal. And I, I think the big deal is a, a, a you use the, the same term here in Japan for um, when, when instead of buying only 25 journals from a publisher, you pay a little bit more and get access to all of the publisher's journals online. It's a great deal in a lot of ways. Unfortunately, it's not sustainable. It cannot continue because Eventually, as the price of your big deal keeps going up, you're gonna have to cancel other things until all you have left is the big deal. And then you'll have to cancel the big deal because then you're out of money entirely. Um, so because it simply can't go on this way, the big deal is going to change into something else. I don't know exactly what it's going to change into, but I strongly suspect that we are going to move from a big deal type of uh, package to what I call the tiny deal, which is buying access to only those articles that you know you need or that your patrons express a need for. The problem with, with what we had for many, many years, which was the journal subscription, is that the journal subscription is just the medium deal. The journal subscription does with articles the same thing that the big deal does with journals. It forces you to buy them in a large bundle even though you only need some of them. When you subscribe to a journal, you're buying, you, you're, you're buying maybe two or three times the number of articles that you actually need. But you're paying for all of them to ensure that you'll have access to the ones that you do need. Um, I, I, 
in fact, my library is already experimenting with a, a, couple of, um, a couple of vendors who are already doing a tiny deal type of program. And they wanted somebody to try it out with, so we're trying it out with them. And that's a, a subject for a whole other presentation. Um, but what I think all of this boils down to is that in the future, the library is going to stop being a pond. Historically, our collection has been a pond, and every year we've tried to dig it deeper and wider and fill it with more water, and then we've tried to get our patrons to come to the pond and drink this, drink this water, come use this good information that we've collected for you. What we're moving to right now is a model that's much more like a river, where there's a constant flow of information going by, and our patrons can reach in and take what they want as they see it. The result is not a collection. It's not a collection as we have traditionally understood it. That is a concept that we may have to let go of to some degree. Certainly in the part of the library that serves the day-to-day -day needs of our students and faculty. Our special collections will always be collections, I think, because these are rare and unique materials that need to be safeguarded. But the utilitarian information, the day-to-day -day information, that does not need to be a collection, and I don't think it will be in the future. So I wanted to share some examples of things that we're doing at the University of Utah. Um, first of all, we have taken a formal stand and said, we have two preferences, and I'll, I think I've got time. I'll tell you a quick story about this. Several years ago, um, I was in a meeting with some of our librarians, and we were talking about the collections, and I just mentioned in passing that we prefer to get e-books when we can rather than print books. And one of the librarians raised her hand, and she said, what? Um, talk to me about this. And, and so I said, well, uh, of course, of course, we're moving in the direction of ebooks because ebooks can be used from outside of the library. They can be used any time of the day or night. They can be searched. Um, you know, there are all kinds of reasons for us to be moving in the direction of ebooks. And besides, our books are being checked out less and less. And she said, if if we're moving in that direction as a library, there needs to be more conversation about this. And I said, okay, I, you're right, you're right. We need to talk about this more explicitly. So I set up a meeting and I said, anybody in the library who wants to come to this meeting, come, I will do a presentation about why we need to move in the direction of e-books rather than print books and talk about it and give me your input. Um, if I'm wrong about this, I want to know. Um, but I'll give you my reasons and then let's discuss it. And then out of this conversation, will come a proposal for the library's executive team. And we will say, this is where the library ought to stand on the issue of e-books versus print books. So we had the meeting, people came, there was a lot of conversation, a lot. <laughs> and as a result, um, we created a document and the document said two things. It said, first of all, if a book is available as both an ebook and a print book, our, our automatic, our default setting is to buy the ebook. Now, if a patron says, I want this book in print, we'll get it for them in print, no problem. If a librarian says, we need to have this book in print, we will make the librarian write a written justification. And the reason for that is that the patron knows what the patron wants. The librarian is guessing what patrons want. So there may be a good reason to get the print as well as the, the E, or there may be a good reason to get the print instead of the E, but if the librarian is saying that, we need to know why. And that's fine. They can tell us, and if it's a good reason, then we'll do it. So first of all, we prefer e-books where possible. Second of all, where we have the opportunity to implement a patron-driven acquisition process rather than a librarian-driven acquisition process, we will do that as well. Our preference is to let our purchases be guided by our patrons rather than by our librarians. Um, 
And as a result, and, and that document was adopted by the library and it is now formal policy. And I think that librarian who objected probably really regrets uh, having, having objected now. Um, because now we have a formal policy, whereas before it was just kind of me talking. Um, but one of the things that we have since done is we've engaged in pilot programs with different providers of patron-driven uh, e-book acquisition. And for those of you, I'm sure many of you know what, what I mean by PDA or patron-driven, but I'll just quickly explain for those who may not. Under a patron-driven acquisition system, the library, and this, uh, this really mostly applies to e-books, instead of the library buying e-books ahead of time and putting them in, in, the, in the catalog, instead we get uh, catalog records for books that we have not purchased. Those go into our catalog. Each record has a link to the full text of the book. And then if a patron uses the book, then we're charged for the book and then it does become a part of our collection. And there are different usage thresholds that result in a purchase. It, it varies from vendor to vendor, and we've experimented with different ones, different models and programs. Um, but this is a system whereby we show the books to our patrons, but we don't buy them until the patrons actually use them. And it's very important to note that what we are doing here is not asking our patrons, should we buy this book? What we are doing is letting our patrons' actual behavior create the purchase. So the patron doesn't know what's going on. The patron just does his work or her work, and, and everything else happens behind the scenes, out of their, out of their site. So we've worked with, uh, the first company that we worked with was called My Eye Library. The way their system worked was we'd put the records into our catalog, and the first time a patron went through the catalog record into the text of the book, it was free. The second time a patron went into the text of the book, it was free. The third time they went through, that triggered a purchase. And now the library owned the book. And there are different models, again, different triggering mechanisms for different vendors. We've worked with My Eye Library. We worked with a company called eBrary. We worked with Net Library. And now we're, we're doing most of our PDA uh, program through a company called EBL. They work directly with our primary book vendor and we've actually integrated this patron-driven acquisition process into our approval plan, uh, into our approval plan system. Another thing that we've done, which is kind of unusual, is we've purchased one of these espresso book machines that I told you about. Um, this is something that I'm very excited about, despite the fact that some aspects of it have been kind of disappointing. I was hoping that with the Espresso Book Machine, we'd be able to provide access to lots and lots of good, high-quality, scholarly books um, without having to buy them ahead of time. That hasn't really happened because the, the catalog records that people search in order to find books on the EBM, those catalog records are so poor, they're so badly done, that they're, they make it hard for people to find the books. So what we've actually been using the Espresso Book Machine for uh, quite a bit is helping local authors with self-publishing. That's been one of our biggest uses of the machine. We're also now using it to print theses and dissertations. Um, the, the archival copies that we keep physically are printed on the Espresso Book Machine. There are some other cool things we're doing with it, but they're, they're outside the scope of this, uh, of this presentation. Um, in our library, we no longer have individual bibliographers or subject specialists. Um, we don't have a music librarian. We don't have a biology librarian. Um, instead, we now have teams, um, and the teams are, are organized according to colleges and interdisciplinary uh, subjects. So we've got um, basically our, our hard sciences team is the one we call SHEM science, health, and engineering and minds. Um, and then we've got a social sciences team, we have a humanities team, we have a separate team for government documents and maps. Um, we have a team for multimedia formats because those are uh, a very, they, they're a very unique, they represent a unique sort of case for us. And then we have the team that we call inter-inter, which is the interdisciplinary and international, uh, or. Uh, international and interdisciplinary studies teams. 
each of these teams has um, some of the book budget that they are responsible to spend every year. Individual members um, submit requests for individual books, but the team as a whole is responsible for that, that piece of the, of the materials budget. Um, to, to, to close, I I'm gonna make some predictions. Um, these are some things that I believe are, are, are going to become true within the next, within the next 10 years. Um, first of all, I think it's true that the library, the successful research library of the future is not going to look very much like the successful research library of the past. It's not just that the book collection will be smaller, although the book collection will be smaller. I think what matters more is that the, the general collections of the library will not only be smaller, but they will be much more tightly focused on the needs of that particular institution. There will be much less of libraries saying, oh, we should buy this book because it's a good book and we're a good library and therefore we should have it. We're not going to be buying books unless they are clearly needed for the people that we serve most directly. Um, at the same time, our collections are going to be supplemented by access to huge public online collections of digitized books. Um, the Google Book Project is one example of, of, of what I think is the future. Even though Google Books has run into a lot of um, roadblocks and problems, I think that it's too fundamentally right, it's too fundamentally logical for it to fail in the long run. Um, and I think that actually the Hati Trust is one example of what the Google Book project is going to make possible in the future. The Hati Trust, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a collection of, at this point, 13 or 14 million digitized books, most of them digitized as part of the Google Book Scanning Project. But they've now been placed in a very, very robust, permanent archive. The books that are under copyright are searchable but not viewable. So if you're doing research on a topic, you can search in Hati Trust, and you can put in your search terms, and the results will say, your search terms appeared 30 times in this book, and 100 times in this book, and 10 times in this book. You can't see the book, but that tells you, oh, that's a book I need to go out and find. That alone is very valuable. The other thing that the Hati Trust project has done is it's taken roughly three million books that are in the public domain that are out of copyright and made them freely viewable to anybody in the world who has access to the internet. If your library becomes a member of Hati Trust, which is very cheap, I think my library is paying something like two or three thousand dollars a year to be Hati Trust members. Um, we, we have, our, our patrons have, can download all of those public domain books as single files. So you find the book, you download the entire book as a PDF for free. Our library collection has about three million print books. When we joined Hati Trust, we doubled the size of our book collection. This is an example of the direction in which we're moving, I believe. We're gonna see more and more of this type of thing. Um, I, I think that uh, packages of subscriptions are going to go away, I talked about that already. Um, and we're going to move increasingly, when it comes to journal content, we're going to move increasingly away from buying even the small bundles that subscriptions represent and brokering access at the article level. Um, and what this is going to mean is that the journal itself is going to go the way of the record album. And this is where we come back to the iPod. When the iPod first came out, I think most of us looked at the iPod and we said, oh, it's a digital version of a Walkman. It's going to do for us the same thing that the Walkman did. The Walkman let you put your cassette or your CD into a machine and walk around and listen to it. And we thought, well, now we'll load our albums digitally onto the iPod and walk around and listen to our albums. That's not what happened. What happened was the iPod destroyed the record industry. And the reason it destroyed the record industry was it took us back 50 years to a music economy that's dominated by the song rather than by the album. 
the record industry grew very quickly between 1950 and 2000 because you can make a lot more money selling 10 songs in a bundle than you can selling a single song. And now with the iPod, record labels are going out of business every day because they can't make as much money as they could. I believe we are going to see the exact same thing happen with journal publishers. The journal is an it, it's just like a record album. You're, you, you are buying articles in a bundle. You cannot make as much money selling individual articles as you can selling journal subscriptions. This is going to completely reshape the journal publishing landscape, I believe. Because it's not just that, oh, it's nice to be able to buy an article. It's that libraries can't afford to keep subscribing anymore, not at the rate of price increase that we're seeing. Um, there are some things that, that will get in our way as we try to move in these directions uh, and as, as we try to respond to these changes in the marketplace. I think that in libraries, we, we sometimes... Um, we sometimes get upset because we can't get our librarians to go along with the changes that need to be made. One time, years ago, um, I, I had written an article and had given some talks about one particular task that I thought we needed to stop doing in the serials departments of our libraries. Just one component of serials work. It was so controversial that I got speaking invitations and writing invitations. And every time I gave a talk, somebody would come up to me afterwards and say, you know, Rick, I think you're right. We need to stop doing that thing. But I will never get my staff to go along with it. And what was so disturbing about that to me is that what these people were describing was not a, a staff problem they were describing a leadership problem. If, if we are going to let staff reluctance stop us from doing the right thing that has to be done, then we are not library leaders. Uh, there, a very wise library director once said to me, there is, we, a problem that we have in our profession is we have too many people who are willing to take a leader's pay and are not willing to do a leader's work. And that is exactly right. If we fail to move in the directions that we need to go, it will not be our staff's fault. It will be our fault for failing to lead. Um, another thing that is going to get in our way that is already getting in our way to some degree is the traditional, uh, the traditional accreditation um, processes. And I don't know how accreditation works in Japan. In the US, Every five or 10 years, your university gets visited by a group of experts, and they come and they analyze how good a job you're doing at your university, and they decide whether your university will continue to be considered a good university that, that people should go to. Um, the folks who come and do a, accreditation visits don't usually want to hear about your exciting new vision for libraries. They want to come and count the number of books on your shelves and go home. So to the degree that this continues to be true, it's, we will struggle to move libraries in the direction that they need to go. There are some signs that this is changing. I think it will change, but it's going to be slow. Um, publishers, uh, for all the reasons that I've already discussed, are also going to be uh, a, a problem um, because the changes that, that need to happen and that will inevitably happen are not all going to be good for publishers. Um, I, I have nothing against publishers. I think publishers are wonderful, but they are going to have to change. Um, and that is going to be very difficult, especially for the very large, very well uh, very successful publishers with a long history of doing things in a certain way, just like libraries. Um, th this is going to be very difficult for them, and to the degree that publishers are not willing to change their practices, we are going to have trouble changing some of our practices in libraries. The biggest challenge for us in libraries, though, I think, is the existence in the marketplace, the marketplace of time and attention, of competitors who are, 
who, who are trying to get the time and attention of our patrons and are doing it in a way that is much more customer focused than our way has been. I, I'll say it again, Google is eating our lunch as a discovery tool because it does not try to turn people into better Google users. That, I think, is maybe the biggest threat that we have to face going forward. And I, and I think that people like Susan Gibbons are pointing the way to us by, by turning the traditional inward-focused library perspective around and saying, what do we need to do in order to make it easier for our students and faculty to do their work? And I'll just say this in closing. Sometimes in libraries, when we talk about making things easier for our patrons, we get in trouble because people say, look, learning is not supposed to be easy. College is not supposed to be easy. And I agree, but there's a very important distinction that we have to remember, and that is, uh, for me personally, I want our students to be stretched and challenged. I want them to be exhausted at the end of a day of academic work but I want them to be stretched and challenged and exhausted by the content of the documents that they are dealing with as students. I don't want them to be stretched and challenged and exhausted trying to get to the documents. I want them to get to the documents immediately, absolutely effortlessly, and then struggle with the content. That's what should be hard. Getting to the documents should not be hard. And, and sometimes in libraries, we struggle with what I call the eat your peas, uh, the eat your peas mentality. Um, we, we need to get beyond that. To the degree that we are able to do that, I think libraries have a bright future. To the degree that we don't, we're dead. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. アンダーソンさんどうもありがとうございましたあの先ほど同様にあのちょ何か確認というようなご質問があればあのお願いをしたいと思いますよろしいでしょうかそれではあのこれで前半終わりましてこれから休憩に入りたいと思います素晴らしいことにプログラム通りの時間で進んでおりますのでえっと15時35分からあの後半のパネルディスカッションを始め,させ始めたいと思いますご協力どうもありがとうございました